We're glad you're here. We believe the Lord is stirring our hearts together. Many of us have different responsibilities. We always want to allow the spontaneity of what the Lord wants to do to just kind of unfold. Uh, he's always a God of wonderful surprises, I find. A wonderful surprises. I appreciate what uh, Paul was saying about the, uh, the fast that the men of the church will be participating in this Wednesday uh, through Saturday morning. And then we're going to gather together and we're going to talk about and encourage each other in what the Lord was speaking to us during the fast, what we're hearing him say, any direction or revelation we received, any encouragement, any progress we made. Because part of what we're called to do as fellow believers is encourage each other. Encourage ye one another. That's, that's such an important scriptural verse. I am so thankful that in my life I have had and sometimes searched for and found people who would be an encouragement to me. Because life is not always encouraging. Life by its very nature tends to beat the scatar out of us, I like to say. Like to say. You ever heard that one before, skatar? I'm not sure what that is, but I picked that up in the early days. Beat the skatar out of us. Um, so this week, the men of the church, Wednesday through Saturday morning. So we want to talk about fasting in preparation for that, as well as um, very often, good morning, David. I felt a fasting anointing walk into the room. I tell you. Um, David and I are fasting brothers for sure. Um, the Lord has really put a grace on our lives and, and uh, we're going to we're gonna pray together or, or offer that anyways at the end of this teaching um, because to fast, to succeed, to, to make progress in anything in the Christian life is not based on yours and my willpower or conviction. Our willpower and conviction is given to us by the Lord so that we can agree with him in what he's doing. We cannot change our own hearts. You're stuck the way you are unless you receive grace for change. It is his grace, which is his empowerment. His, his, it's, I, I like to think of it as like nuclear matter. It is, it is, it is miraculous just by itself. Grace is not an excuse for how we failed. Grace is the answer so that we can succeed and overcome. So when we receive grace from the Lord, it's not to excuse us. It's not the end of the story like, well, you failed. You need some grace so you don't feel bad about it. Grace is not the end of the story. Grace is the beginning of the solution. Where after we failed, the reason we failed is because we failed because we had a shortage of grace. And so we humble ourselves in our despondency, disappointment, failure, in our sackcloth and ashes. And we call out to the Lord, and what does he give to those who are humble? He gives grace to the humble. Why? To lift us out of that place of humility and defeat and despondency. And so grace is not the end that comes at the end of failure, but rather it's the beginning of God solving the problem, empowering us to do better. And there's a scripture, and I don't have the reference handy right now, but where Paul says, these things I accomplished, and then he stops mid-sentence and he says, not I, but the grace that was at work in me accomplished these things. So grace helps us accomplish. And so we want to lay hands at the end of this service. I'm going to ask Dave Navera to join me. Um, I think we would both credit um, whatever success we've had in the Lord to a fasted life, to employ what I would like to call for the naming of this sermon this morning, fasting, a power tool for the wise. Fasting is a power tool for the Christian it, for, to have a successful life. Starting out, uh, I'd like to tell you a little parable. Uh, Paul and Pierre. Have you ever heard the Paul and Pierre 
uh, up here in Maine, many of us are of you know French descent, and so I know I grew up in Michigan. It was, there was always Polish jokes. Uh, up here, and I got here to Maine. Everyone's telling French jokes. So if you're French, please don't be offended. But this is a story of Paul and Pierre, and uh, there, uh, Paul he owns the uh, the local school rental hardware store, and Pierre, his good friend, is is a woodcutter. And, you know, he sells firewood and he, he logs and he keeps the hardwood and he, you know, he has a side business, not just, you know, cutting the pine for lumber yards, but the hardwood for splitting and burning and, you know, cutting it all up into small lengths. And uh, he comes in one day and he's just really frustrated because he's been, he's been cutting and sawing with a handsaw. And uh, so he talks to his buddy Paul, who owns the hardware store, and he says, uh, you know, I, I heard there's this, you know, new thing called the chainsaw. And uh, Paul says, oh, yeah, you will cut easily, you know, three to four times the amount of wood that you would normally cut. And uh, you should really be paying attention to this, Rich, because you, you, you think how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck <laughs> could chuck in a truck with a duck wood. <laughs> And uh, if you're at the Christmas party, you get that joke. If you weren't, then uh, <laughs> Rich and, uh, and his wife Cheryl did a, did a, a fun little gag at the uh, Christmas party. And uh, so, so Pierre says, oh, you know, sounds good to me. And uh, so he doles out the money, he buys it, and he disappears into the woods for about a week. And about a week later, he comes back out of the woods, and he says, Paul, he says, uh, this is a total waste of time. I don't, I don't know why you sold me this. Um, it, it does work, and it's better than, than hand sawing, but I'm only cutting maybe one and a half, two times the wood. And so Paul says, well, uh, maybe, maybe it's not working right. And so Pierre hands him the saw that he brought back for the exchange, and Paul takes it, and he pulls the handle, off it goes, and Pierre goes, oh, what that noise? <laughs> All right. And then fastings like that. It's available, and it's in your toolbox, so that you might be more successful and accomplish more. But most people don't know how it works. Or we're not using it appropriately. And so it's important to know not just what fasting is, but how to use it and why it's important. How does fasting work? What's the deal with fasting? Number one, you can fast for health or physical purposes. When you fast, after so many hours, your body releases T cells, which are the regenerative cells in your body. It also, if you're fasting, you are controlling your insulin and your cortisol. And those are, those are hormonal chemicals that tell your body to store fat. And so fasting has physical and health properties. As a matter of fact, um, probably 20 or 30 years ago, doctors, they'd all get all nervous about fasting. Present day, there's lots of research, lots of breakout information where doctors and medical professionals now are much more agreeing with the scripture. All the major religions of the earth have had seasons of fasting, and they're not looking to do something that's detrimental to their adherence, but something that is beneficial to us. It's prescribed. Fasting has a spiritual prescription to it. Also for fasting, there's a spiritual purpose. And Paul touched on that in his announcement concerning the men's fast. Fasting, now there is some teaching that differs with this, and I, I'm in direct opposition to it. That fa Some people say fasting moves God. I don't believe that at all. I think when we examine biblical fasting, it doesn't move God. It opens you to hear what God is saying. And it encourages you to do what God has purposed for you to do. But God doesn't change. Fasting is not a way that Christians manipulate God to do something he wasn't planning on doing. Fasting moves us. It opens the ear. It refreshes the human soul and spirit to hear and perceive. It actually 
depresses self and allows the real you, the spirit man on the inside, to ascend. And rather than you, the spirit man, being the slave to your passions, it empowers you above your passions and desires and can we even use the word addictions fasting is powerful to break free from addictions and discipline fasting is good for discipline not just spiritual discipline not just physical discipline soul discipline your mind your will your emotions it's it's a good discipline and we know that the Disciples of John the Baptist and the disciples of the Pharisees and the scripture, it's revealed to us that they fasted regularly. They fasted at least two days a week just as a spiritual discipline. And they came to Jesus and they said to Jesus, now how come our guys are disciplined and your guys are sloppy? Our guys, we all fast. We intentionally activate God's power tool. But your disciples, we don't ever see you guys fasting. And if you remember the stories, it's in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that Jesus answered them and says, while the bridegroom is with them, they're rejoicing and they're feasting. But when the bridegroom is gone, in other words, referring to himself and his eventually leaving the planet, then they shall fast. So as Christians, we are not relieved from the wisdom of fasting, but rather by Jesus' own confession, when he would be gone from us and we would be waiting for his return, that during that season of time, Jesus said, they shall fast. Because Jesus understood the benefits of fasting. Amen? Amen. So before fasting, it's important to determine the purpose of your fast. Why are you fasting? And here you can see that there are health benefits, there's spiritual benefits, and there's just good old discipline in it to have a life of fasting. I know of one of the most successful missionaries in modern times at least has raised hundreds of people from the dead in Mexico. And those who are his disciples, who work with him in ministry, have also raised hundreds of people from the dead. And they, by conviction and by what they feel is hearing the Lord instruct them how to have a powerful spiritual life, is they do a full water fast every other day. Because Jesus said, this kind cometh not out except by prayer and fasting. And they says, we deal with a lot of devils on the mission field. Well, how many of you know we deal with a lot of devils in the modern world? They're just not so on the surface. They're just under the surface a little bit more. And there are demons that you need to overcome and many that you will run into on a regular basis that might need to be cast out of somebody that the Lord wants to minister to you. But he'll never speak to you or you'll never hear him say cast that out because you don't know how to use God's power tool and obtain the grace that is next to necessary to empower you into a successful deliverance ministry. But they have a successful deliverance ministry that results in people being raised from the dead. And their primary power tool is prayer and fasting. It's important. Let me give you some scriptures The book of Esther, you just write that down generally. The whole story is worth reading, so I'm not just going to give you a chapter and a verse. But Esther, Esther knew that by calling a fast, not just for herself, but a corporate fast, that she could access courage that she needed to fulfill God's purpose for her in that day. Remember, we all can quote Mordecai, her her uncle or her cousin, or it's kind of like father figure, if nothing else. He says to her, who knows, but that God has brought you into the kingdom in this situation for this hour, for this day, for this assignment. 
God's purpose was for her to rise up, to do, to basically take up her cross. I know it's before Christ. But so to speak, to take up her cross, deny herself, put aside her fears and the fact she could very well die within the hour if the king did not receive her. And she needed to have the courage, this young girl whose only accomplishment in life was she won the beauty contest. This, in her own mind and probably everyone else's mind, this lucky gal who won the beauty contest and somehow, through a miracle of God, is now queen, and she happens to be a Jew, but secretly, and her people throughout that whole area are being threatened with extinction, Suddenly, she needs to access courage that she does not have. So she calls a fast. And what does she do? She steps up and she becomes one of the greatest heroes in Scripture. Fasting preceded her heroism. Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit, self-control, discipline of your flesh and yourself. What does that mean, self-control? It means that your spiritual part, you, you the spirit man, has taken a place of ascendancy and leadership and told your flesh what to do. And we all have that as a potential and a possibility. That me, John, on the inside, in Christ, regenerated by a work of the Spirit of God, the newborn, born-again John on the inside, I do not have to be a slave to my fleshly passions and desires. And so fasting is a discipline that I, the spiritual man, employ regularly in my life to keep my flesh in the right place. Matthew chapter 9. I'll give you these next three together. And this is where Jesus says, my disciples shall fast. That's the first part of the, of the paragraph. And then we're going to talk about the second part of that here in a moment. But let me give you the scriptures first. Matthew chapter 9, verse 15. Mark chapter 2, verse 21. And Luke 5, verse 33. It's the same story, the same encounter in three of the Gospels. And the information's just a little bit different that we're given from each of those Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's Matthew 9, 15, Mark 2, 21. Luke 5.33. This, this for me was probably one of the key scriptures on fasting that helped me understand the, the power in fasting. Fasting is a means of grace. It's an important part of the Christian life. This is where Jesus says, my disciples shall fast. But interestingly, this is where he talks about a new garment and a new wineskin. So we have Jesus, the inaugurator of a new covenant, living in an old covenant day. Because how many of you know the old covenant was in place until Jesus shed his blood and established a new covenant? And proved that he did by being raised from the dead. And then he enforces it by his ascension in heaven by interceding for us from the throne. So there's the, there is the inaugurating of it, the establishing of it, and the imposing of it taking place in the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. But the deal is, Jesus and his disciples are the inaugurators and implementers of a new covenant, yet they are living 
in an old covenant dispensation of time. So when they come to Jesus and they say, why aren't your guys fasting? Jesus tells them a parable. He says, he says first, first he says, while I'm here, they're not, but when I'm gone, they will. Why will they when he's gone and not now at that present time? He says, he says it. He says it plainly in a parable, but plainly. You don't sew a new patch on an old garment. He's talking, the context is of the disciples. The disciples were not to be sewn into as a new piece of fabric into an old garment. They were new covenant ministers. They were not to be sewn in as new covenant ministers into an old covenant system and garment. That's what fasting would do to them. And they'd get ripped and torn and the whole garment would be compromised. Jesus says, no, no. He says, or to put it another way, he tells them another parable right behind. You don't put new wine into an old wineskin. In other words, my disciples are of the new covenant, the new wine, and it doesn't work to put new wine into an old wineskin because what happens when you do that? The wineskin bursts, the old wineskin, and the wine is lost. Rather, he says, you put new wine into a new wineskin, which is what is going to happen when Jesus is no longer present, that they, as new wine, will need to be poured into whatever the new wineskin is, so that the new wine will not be lost, and neither will the wineskin be destroyed, because it's a new wineskin. Does that make sense? So what does fasting do? Fasting pours you as new wine into the new season. How many of you received a prophetic word? God says, you're coming into a new season. I hear the Lord saying, some old stuff is passing away. This is a season for some new things. You're, if you understand fasting, your first response should be, I need to, I need to, I need to fast. I need to fast and pray to get the mind of the Lord that will pour me into a new wineskin or like a piece of new fabric, sew me into his new purposes for my life. It's just like if you get a prophetic word for, I see the Lord blessing you, multiplying you, a harvest financially coming into your life, I, 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 I see it's just around the corner. This is what the Lord is doing. He's preparing you for financial increase. What's the first thing you need to do? Up your giving. Because in the same manner you sow, you also shall reap. To the same degree you sow, the same degree you, you reap. First thing I do when I get a prophetic word concerning finances and an increase, I increase my giving. Because that Law of sowing and reaping is immutable. It is unchangeable. It's a truth. When I get a word concerning a new season or God doing a new thing in my life, I want to lay hold of it. I want to be sewn into the fabric of what God is doing. What is God's prescription for that? According to the words of Jesus, two parables that say the same thing, I'm going to enter into a season of fasting and prayer. Does that make sense? Yeah. So wisdom is, if you keep doing the same thing you've always done, you're always going to get the same result. So stop doing that. Do something new. And for a lot of us now, as we discover, some of us maybe for the first time this morning, what fasting actually does. It's, we, we sometimes think, how can something so physical as not eating food have a spiritual consequence. Think of the sexual activity. When you have sex with another person, part of you becomes theirs. 
A spiritual soul tie is developed. Spiritual things happen when we do physical stuff. When I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and then do something very physical, confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord, boom, regeneration by the Holy Spirit takes place and I am born again. And all I did was rattle my vocal cords. I already had the faith in my heart, but when I did the physical part, Something eternal took place. So we see that with our confession. We see that with the sexual act. We see that with fasting. We see it with many things. That these have spiritual consequence. They are spiritually powerful. Spiritually powerful. So fasting pours me into the new wineskin of what God is doing. Fasting sews me into the new garment that God is bringing forth. We can find in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, that in, in Antioch, before the sending of Before they heard what to do with Paul and Barnabas, they fasted. They had a sense that something was up. These guys that were prophet teachers, God wants to do something with those guys. He's going to reach into this pool of prophets and pull out for himself two apostles. And we need these guys to be plugged into what God has for them because they're going to reach the Gentiles and they are actually going to develop the whole system of faith in the new covenant for Gentiles. They got to get it right. So while they were praying and fasting... And I believe they, they had a sense that the jig is up. Something's going on. This is a season that's important here. We've been cruising along with prophet teachers. Now all of a sudden something new is going to come forth. We're not really sure what it is. We as leaders need to be fasting and praying. We as a church need to be fasting and praying. We as men who are leading families and carrying responsibilities in the kingdom need to be fasting and praying. And so, while they're fasting and praying, the Lord says, set apart Paul and Barnabas. What happened? It didn't provoke God to speak. It opened their ears to what they were kind of sensing. Something's going on. They fast and pray. Their ears are open. They hear the Lord say, set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them. And then... Before they laid hands and did something else and released them in the grace of God, what did they do? They fasted and prayed again. Why? Why didn't they just act? Because fasting is one of the ways we access grace. They were going to lay hands and impart a fresh commission, a fresh calling, a fresh anointing on these two who used to be the same as them, prophet teachers, and they were going to move into something different now. We also find, I don't have the reference for you, but you can look it up easy enough. Uh, one of the nice things about, about uh, modern technology is you used to have to search through a concordance like a Strong's Concordance, you know, for similar words. Now, if you, if you don't even know the language to, to look up, you can Google it. I mean, Google will tell you what you're looking for. So you can look up elders and fasting, or ordaining elders and fasting. You don't have to look it up in your concordance. You can look it up on Google, for goodness sake. And you'll find that before elders were appointed... Fasting was part of the ingredient mix that took place 
before elders were chosen. Fasting is important. What does that mean to, to you and me? Practical application. Before a big decision, before I make any big decision, I fast. Linda tells the story that uh, uh, hers and my relationship back in 1983 uh, was spinning quickly. And we were both feeling in our hearts that we had, we had found our, our spouse. And she decided to fast and to pray. And so she got up, I think it was probably the first day of the fast. And her parents had said something like, every answer you need is, is in the word. The, 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 Lord will, the, the, Lord, the Lord will speak to you. And so she takes her Bible, and in those days it was one with a cover and pages, not just one of these. And uh, she took it. She, she did like this, closed her eyes, pointed to a scripture, and it fell in the book of John. There was a man sent from God, his name is John. <laughs> yeah. True story. <laughs> I'm glad she fasted and prayed. The Lord showed her clearly. What should you expect as you fast, when you fast? Men of the church, what would you be expecting this week? Now, I'd like to say to the fellow who, Richard, who said, uh, you know, Christmas party, I don't know if my plans changed. Well, you can go to a Christmas party and not eat. Or you can go to a Christmas party and make, make a, it's your choice what you're going to fast. Okay. So you may, on that day, just do, I mean, I, I want to just give you permission, you know, but you, you listen to the Lord. But just from the place of general instruction, you may say, Wednesday I'm going to full fast. And Thursday I'm going to full fast. And Friday I'm just going to just eat only the equivalent of one meal a day. Or I'm, I'm going to eat these things, but not these things. Um, if you're taking medication, uh, some of your medication, you, it's, it's, it's medically dangerous for you to just cold turkey stop your medication, but you have to take medication with food or it hurts you. In those cases, you have the ability to determine how you're going to fast. You might, maybe you take your pills in the morning. So you say, I'm just going to eat a hard-boiled egg and a cup of coffee for breakfast because that's all I need in my stomach to not hurt myself when I take my medications. Or you might say, I'm going to fast the other two meals a day and the snacks and just eat one meal a day. That's still a fast. Because you're determining in your heart, you are setting aside legal pleasures in the pursuit of something higher. Some people do liquid fasts, some people fast media. Now, when the Bible talks about fasting, the context is always food. But the spirit of fasting, the, 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 the spiritual understanding behind it, is not that there's any magic in eating food or not eating food. It is denying yourself, letting your spirit man take ascendancy, and giving up a pleasure in pursuit of something higher. What are we seeking? We're seeking understanding. We're seeking wisdom. We're seeking clear direction. We're listening with a spiritual ear. Anything that's going to distract me from that, I'm going to eliminate. If you're taking your medication and you're sitting there with a burning stomach and, and shivers and shakes... You're not eliminating any distractions. You're actually creating a bigger distraction during your fast. 
So do you see how the wisdom comes in with it? We don't, we don't want to take these truths from Scripture and mix legalism with it. Yet we also don't want to mix license with it. Where you can just do whatever you, you want. The point is to press forward into kingdom stuff. So what should you expect while you're fasting? Your carnal drives, urges, passions, and addictions will be challenged. They'll be diminished. Then again, if it's, a, if it's an addiction and it has a spiritual root, it might even get fired up in response to, to, to move you into breaking your fast. Because some of this stuff, if it's demonic, it doesn't want you fasting. So you're going to get some kickback maybe as well. Some will just die, diminish. Other stuffs might, might flare. Just tough it out. Starve it out. Number two, to expect. It'll open your spiritual ears. It is amazing. You will just be sitting and driving, and you'll just hear the Lord begin to speak to you. Some people say to me, I, you, you talk like the Lord's always talking to you. you know, I heard the Lord say, or I was... You know, the, you know, the Lord impressed upon my heart yesterday, you know, thus and so. And they're like, man, you know, it's like God's always talking to you? Yeah, pretty much, most of the time. Well, I'd like to hear God. Well, skip a meal once in a while. Go a day and just turn your attention to him. Begin to develop that hearing mechanism that's on the inside of all of us. So it opens your spiritual ears. Number three. It knits you into God's purposes for you for the season. And if you certainly full fast and water fast, you should expect to lose weight. And that's actually a good reason to fast. It's probably the healthiest way to lose weight. You know, it... All, all, all the fat that clings to our bodies, it's there for a purpose. It's not there to make you pretty. Right? It's, it's not a beauty indicator. It's, it's there, it's food for when you're not eating. And so you're creating a time for your body to, to, uh, to, to eat and, and uh, consume some of the fat that has been stored away just for that purpose. I know for myself, I could probably do a 40-day fast and, and suffer no harm. Some of us could, could fast for weeks. You know the longest fast? Medically supervised. Longest full fast uh, uh, recorded in history? 382 days. The guy was huge. He lost, I don't know, a couple hundred pounds. But his body went into this state of autophagy where not only did it burn its own fat, but it burned all the sagging skin. And he came out of that fast. He didn't have big rolls of, you know, extra skin. He, it, it's amazing. You can Google that if you want to. Longest fast. Medically supervised, completely healthy, 382 days. <laughs> you, know, you wonder, does your body remember what to do when you start eating again? Oh yeah, you started eating and the digestive tract kicked right in and began working just like normal. We don't have to be afraid of fasting. That's the reason I said that. We don't have to fear it. We want to enter into it with wisdom and understanding, but we don't have to be afraid of it. To deny yourself a legal pleasure in exchange for something higher or better. And I always say a legal pleasure. Something that, you know, in God's assessment of things is not illegal. Like, I, I know some people, you know, their, their, their life is full of vices. And they say, well, you know, I'm going to stop swearing. I'm going to fast cursing. Or I'm going to fast lying. Or I'm going to fast. 
I'm going to fast meth. He was like, what? You know, and we need deliverance from that, right? All right. So the, the, the spirit of fasting is you choosing something higher by rejecting something lower, like food. As a matter of fact, um, during times of fasting is the only scriptural allowance for the husband and wife to not satisfy each other sexually. That we are supposed to minister to each other in marriage concerning that physical union except during seasons of fasting. And the Lord actually makes an exception for that in the scripture. That's how important fasting is. God actually imposes himself into our most private relationships, the most private activity in a private relationship, and says, okay, fasting is more important than that. Fasting is pretty important to the Lord if he speaks to it at that depth of intimacy. It's important. So, for example, here's some things that are commonly fasted. Media. I am of the persuasion that alcohol is not evil, but alcohol can easily be a temptation that leads us into a ditch. So we better be careful. But if you are, if you are a social drinking um, Christian, uh, that's, that's completely possible. But you might want to fast alcohol for that season. That's, that's kind of like a Nazarite vow or fast. Paul entered into one of those shaved his head, and abstained from certain things as a prescribed biblical fast. The Nazarite lifestyle doesn't have to be a lifelong commitment. There can be a season that you commit yourself to no alcohol. Nazarite. You can fast a meal. You can fast certain types of food. Uh, There are some people, and I I don't know the wisdom of this, but there are some people who do a, what they call a, a full fast and a dry fast where no food or water. I think that is, uh, that should only be considered after you get some real good advice and counsel. But a water fast, I mean fasting and drinking nothing but water, that's, that's highly recommended and is the normal fast of Scripture. Then there's that whole thing like that that is one of those modified fasts, like the Daniel fast. It's just a modified fast. Actually, it's probably more than a modified fast because you have a bunch of Jewish guys that weren't going to eat the pork that was being offered to them by the Babylonian Gentiles. And so there was, it wasn't just that you know, they weren't eating uh, tasty stuff or just eating bread. That was about, again, not eating that which is offensive and only eating that which would have a, have a result of uh, advancement, pursuing something higher. So fasting is safe. It's healthy. You had to use wisdom. And it is commanded by Jesus in the scripture. And, but you and I are responsible as to how we fast and what we fast. And there's always a good place for clarifications, questions, answers, counsel, wisdom. Talk to people who have a, a fasted uh, lifestyle. And that doesn't just mean they don't eat a lot. That means that they, they employ God's power tool of fasting into their life. Amen? How are we doing? Good. Do we, have, do we want to field any questions? You've got something maybe? Any of you who are fasters, did I misspeak on something and I left a long, totally wrong impression? Richard, did you have a...
Yeah. Yeah. And daily encouragement, you know, plug, plug in, build a, build a relationship. Uh, that's kind of the, you know, the testimony of Esther's fast. She's like, man, I'm going to do this alone. I'm just going to cave. I'm going to, I'm going to ask everybody I know to join with me in it. That, that's an important piece. Good point, Richard. Any other comment on fasting? Guy? Well, I'm just so glad that I got to meet you yeah. and to uh, be fed solid food. I know this, that's not fasting, yeah. but thank you for feeding us the Word of God. Well, you're welcome. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Guy. Yes? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Day two and three can be tough. Sometimes day one, you know, you'll walk by the M&M container at work and you know, you'll eat yourself, you know, those little mini Snickers and you're like, oh, no. Okay, so if you've made up your mind to fast um, and, and you find that, oh, I just violated my own fast, easy. Spit it out. Or swallow it and resolve yourself to not take another bite, you know, whatever works. You can't just spit out a chewed Snicker bar in the middle of the carpet at work, right? Uh, then all you do is you just hit that internal reset button. It's called repentance. You say, Lord, I felt as though you're calling us to this. I acknowledge that. Or you called me to this. I just, I just fell short. Lord, please, as I hit my reset button, download some added grace to me. I want to succeed at this. I want to learn what you're teaching me. But after day two or three, yeah, the... Yes? I was going to say, um, so sometimes when you fast, you may think, well, I work a, a hard job, I have a, a lot of lifting, or mm -hmm. it's very physical, and I don't know if I can do a full fast. And my husband has done several 40-day only water fasts, and I don't know, day 20, we had to put up, you know, 600 bales of hay. God does give you the ability to sustain, and in, and he'll honor whatever commitment you do. And he was wise. He took breaks, and he drank lots of water, and rested when he needed to, so he didn't, you know, just kill mm -hmm. himself. But there's an a example of somebody who worked a very physical job, but still was able to sustain his fast, but again, using wisdom and, and not allowing that to be a deterrent for why you were doing a certain fast. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't expect any of us is going to jump up and do a 21 or a 40 day fast here tomorrow. But, uh, you know, when you, if, if you're going to do a longer fast, yeah, there are considerations to make for work. You know, if you're a roofer, uh, you better get some good advice and counsel as to an extended fast. Because you don't be standing up in the ladder and get lightheaded because you're working hard and sweating a lot and your electrolytes are off. You know, oftentimes the activity that, that accompanies fasting is what? What in fasting? Prayer. Prayer, which isn't a highly strenuous physical activity. <laughs> right? So sometimes, you know, you're withdrawing to a mountain or a cave in ancient times. Or you're, or you're holding yourself up in your study. Or you're, you know, you're not doing uh, super heavy work. Um, you'll find that, that your energy level for bursts of energy is pretty good. Because just think of the way God designed us. If you're starving and you haven't killed an antelope or a gazelle lately uh, to get sustenance, are you, the longer you fast, the weaker you're just going to get in general? No, because you will need bursts of energy to capture your prey so that you can continue to eat and survive. So the, the myth that you're fasting, you're just totally wrung out all the time, is really a myth. But sustained activity, that's a whole nother deal. You want to manage that. You want to cooperate. David, do you have a comment? Yeah. Sure. yeah. So um, what I'd like to share is um, a little about my uh, very first fast. As a Christian, I don't consider doing Lent as really a fast. I did that all my life, but, you know, giving up candy right. yeah. before Easter, you know, consider that fasting. Yeah, although it is fasting. It is fasting, yes. So, um, but, but you're not talking about no, I, giving up candy. 
No, I'm not talking, talking about, about giving like up candy. So, so my real fast, I had just been saved uh, the date, April 14th, 91. The church I belonged to down in Texas called one uh, beginning of June, a fast. So it was my first one. Um, I do water for two days and I lose 10 pounds because I'm 22 and I have a metabolism. So they were like, you need to... Well, you're an athlete too. Yes. Yeah. And then you need to eat something. I'm like, okay. But, uh, so, uh, these 21 days really set the course of my life that I still continue today. It was amazing what happened in my very first fast. And I just want to kind of give you uh, what you can expect. So, June 3, I go to dinner with somebody. We go to somebody's house. And they start talking about the Holy Spirit. And as a very new believer, I get filled to fullness with the living water of God. Some of you have shared this. I didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. I'm sitting at a table. I, I get the Holy Spirit and out of my belly, living water. And it would not stop. It was an open faucet. And I spoke in tongues for 45 minutes till my mouth just could not speak anymore. But it wouldn't, sh it wouldn't stop. So that's number one, is that you can expect an encounter with the Holy Spirit. This is a spiritual thing. You can expect that. Number two was the pastor during the season uh, as a 22, almost 23-year-old, had this great message and was like, who wants to be married? I have, a, I have a message for you next week. And I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. And so it was a hook. <laughs> and the whole message was about marrying Jesus and intimacy with God. And that's what you can expect from this is a new level of intimacy, a new level of abiding and connecting. And because like I, I, I've shared this before, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's our walk. And this is part of our walk, biblically. And when we're doing it, we just feel that, that, that stronger connection that stronger abiding and this intimacy that is just. And then, um, I don't want to go into too many details, but at the, at the time of this in my life, I did have some, I was addicted to prescription drugs. I had uh, unfortunate things happen to me and Secularly, their idea of dealing with that is, you know, let me give you some drugs. Yep. And so I was hooked. And uh, couldn't, I was just struggling. So a week later, uh, I am by myself in my room, and I'm reading the word, and a revelation hits me. Because I'm saved now like maybe two months the revelation hits me that the word of God is true. I say that out loud. I'm reading the word and then I hold up my Bible in front of me and I say the word of God is true. And then I say, if this is true, I don't need all these prescription drugs. And I tell my pastor that, we go through this thing and, and I really... I, I, I stop at cold. I just stop taking them. And the Lord, so another, what you can expect is the word of God to come alive. It is the bread that we get, especially when you're fasting, you want bread. And the Bible is the perfect bread to sustain you and you will get revelation, you will get food that you need 
for that moment, for that hour, for whatever. You know, Jesus said to pray, give me my daily bread. There is a daily bread that God has for us that we just ask for yeah. and he'll give it to us. Yeah. So, so the biggest thing, and I think he, he, Apostle John touched on it, is it we can't get religious about fasting. You know what I mean? A lot of people, it's not a works thing. It's not a religious thing. It is 100% relation, relational. Yeah. It's a spiritual act, and, and we are spirit beings, and it's just part of who we are. Amen. Amen. And, that, and that's a good, good final thought there, too. Um, in in uh, drawing close to the Lord, being led by him, uh, Jesus didn't, didn't go into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and to fast 40 days because it was the religious legalistic prescription, but he was led by the spirit to do that. And uh, so we, we don't, we don't want to just have so, this so systematized that it just becomes, oh, you know, that's what we do. Um, there is a place for us fasting together. Um, there's also a time for the Lord to speak to your heart and for you to fast in secret. But there's also a place for us to fast together corporately. And so we want to be led by the Spirit in that, just like we want to be led by the Spirit and everything else. Um, so we, we don't have necessary times that we, that um, every year, every week that we fast, although um, Tuesday is a, a day of prayer for us here where we pray together and some of us meet in teams and, and uh, talk about and pray about uh, what the Lord is doing in this region of the world. And we encourage people to fast, if they're going to fast during the week, to fast during that day of prayer. It's, it just makes it all the more powerful. Um, but we want to be led by the Spirit in it. And I think that's the, the, the heart of what you're saying, David, right? To, to not just become religious about it. Um, we certainly find that Jesus encountered and encountered that, that religious way of thinking uh, by the Pharisees. And uh, he didn't submit to that. But yet he was led by the Spirit. And he fasted as an example for us. Uh, Noah. Yeah, I'd just like to share that. The first time I really felt God speaking to me in my life, uh, when I was a total atheist, I was hitchhiking across the country, and there were periods where there wasn't much food because we had no money. Yep. And um, you know, long stretches in the desert with nothing around. And those times of being really hungry is when I really actually started listening. Good, good. Something and and you're just doing something physical. Thinking I'm just not eating, mm -hmm. but something spiritual was at work as well. They go hand in hand. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand, and uh, if you, uh, I know, I know some of us. You know, we 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 we've, we've fasted. We've you know, entered into these things and we say, gee, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know, times of fasting, uh, uh, that's not a big deal, you may say. And uh, from someone who is uh, familiar with fasting, it may not be a big deal for you. But to many, many, many of us, even fasting a whole day can really look like a big deal. And we want to encourage you. That's part of what we do as fellow believers. We encourage. Something that is very much impartable by the laying on of hands is courage. It's what dads do to their kids when they're facing an obstacle. Come over here. They'll put their hand on their shoulder and say, you can do this. You can tackle this. You're smart enough for this. They have everything they need to succeed except the courage to tackle the situation. So there's hopefully someone in their life that puts their hand on their shoulder and takes from their own courage, dad takes from his courage, puts it on the shoulder of that son or daughter and says, you can do this. Sometimes the impartation is just that simple. That's all we need to, to get over the hump. Other times, we really do need something more than that. And we need an impartation of even a greater grace. And so if you are saying in your heart, 
yeah, I get it. I understand now how fasting works. Um, if you're one of the men of this church and, and you're going to enter in, but you're, you're really trepidatious about it, you definitely want to come forward. And uh, David and I will lay hands on you. Because one thing that I know about this guy is he understands fasting. He has a grace to fast. And, uh, and I know about my life uh, that, that's, that, that as well. Um, I love to fast. Um, when I'm fasting, I cook my family dinner. I don't find it a struggle because I know there's a, there's a grace on my life for it. And I think we can all have that and we can share that with each other. So if you would like prayer for either courage or an additional grace, a greater grace, to just enter in and fast and be successful at it, um, we're going to lay hands on you and we want to invite you to do that.